Hello, and welcome to IVM, another IVM webinar. My name is Greg Wolf. I'm the Education Manager for IVM. Thank you so very much for coming on today. Um, before we start, uh, let's go with some technical issues. If you have any issues with sound or you can't see the screen, please send me a chat uh, through your uh, through your um, GoToMeeting um, uh, portal, and I will be happy to help you. I will be taking questions at the end of the session. Uh, but with that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Matt Nebel, PE. He's an associate at Walter P. Moore, uh, one of our ally members. Uh, the name of the session is The Evolution of Safety Act, New Developments in Protective Design for Sports Venues and Other Facilities Starts in Day One. Matt, take it away. Great, Greg. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is, again, this is Matt Nebel with Walter P. Moore. And as you'll see here in a few seconds, Akma Ali with Catalyst Partners and myself recorded this webinar due to some travel arrangements that the both of us had today. So with that, we're gonna kick it in here and play the webinar. Enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone had a great weekend and a good Monday to start the week. We are going to wrap up your Monday with this webinar on the evolution of Safety Act, new developments in protective design for sports venues and other facilities. And we understand there was an IAVM webinar in February titled Selection of Safety Barriers for access control venues by CalPipe Security Bollard, Bollards that also briefly touched on safety act. So these two webinars will complement each other well. Feel free to check that webinar out too. We would like to thank IAVM for having us to present this webinar. As you may be able to tell, we have recorded this webinar due to a change up in schedules. So while it's Monday for you, it's Friday for us. All right, so for this webinar, it will be a combination of slides and a panel-like discussion. So we'll be looking to get some good conversations started within our group. Your speakers for the webinar will be myself, Matt Neville. I'm, a Walt, I'm with Walter P. Moore and a Secure Design Project Manager. And this is Akmal Ali, uh, Principal at Catalyst Partners. And Akmal and myself, uh, the Walter P. Moore and Catalyst teams have worked together on numerous Safety Act projects, and that's the basis of the conversation that we're going to have here today is share some of our experiences working on Safety Act projects together. Yeah, I'd like to thank you, Matt, for having uh, us participate on this um, really important presentation. Uh, for those who don't know, Catalyst Partners is a Homeland Security consulting firm located here in the heart of D.C. Um, myself, by way of background, uh, I used to work in the Safety Act office within the Department of Homeland Security, formerly serving in the role of Deputy Director of the program, and really saw the program expand over the years. And uh, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about how that expansion has now impacted venue operators and the industries that all of you are in. Um, so, and we'll talk about where, how that evolution has occurred and what does it mean now for the protective design element of, of venue operation. Perfect. So that's a little bit about Callus Partners. Uh, Walter P. Moore, a little bit about us. We are an international engineering consulting company. We have 20 plus offices here in the United States and five international offices. Headquartered out of Houston, Texas, we now have over 600 individuals within our company, uh, 175 plus licensed engineers. Some of our practice areas, we have four core practice areas within Walter P. Moore. Infrastructure, structures, diagnostics, and technology consulting. Uh, specifically for the Safety Act, that, that service resides within our secure design group, uh, which is part of our structures group. But what's interesting about this kind of connectivity between the Walter P. Moore service lines is we value integration across all of our service lines. So while secure design is part of structures, we integrate well with our other our other groups. And as an example, we're currently working with, with Ocmo and Catalyst on one Safety Act project. And as we've moved into the design implementation phase, Walter P. Moore is supporting that project within our structures, our infrastructure civil engineering group, and secure design. So our panel topics for today, we've got eight listed here. We won't go through them all as we'll touch bases. We cut, go through each one. The first three kind of set the, the background information on, on Safety Act to give the audience uh, some feel of Safety Act. We understand it's important in the venue industry right now, so you may be familiar with it, but we'll do a little bit of an intro there. And then the last couple topics really dive into the meat of the, the discussion today of protective design and how Safety Act has evolved to start incorporating that into the projects. So the first topic here, what is Safety Act? And I'll turn it over here to Akmal to give a background information on that. Sure. So the, 
the running thing here again is, you know, how has Safety Act evolved and, and, and how is protective design playing a part in that? But before we do that, obviously we should lay some groundwork. Most of you probably are familiar with the Safety Act. They've done a great job um, in getting the word out on the program. A lot of big uh, high profile companies have, gotten, have gone through the pro program and have received Safety Act awards, awards so you've probably heard about it uh, one way or the other. But just for those who aren't familiar with it, the Safety Act program was really developed in response to industry's pleas for help following acts of terrorism that we've seen in the past. Um, you're, everyone's probably familiar with what happened in the, 90, in the 93, 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Um, obviously, a uh, tragic day, loss of life, uh, lots of injuries. Uh, but what a lot of people aren't familiar with is the fact that the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, uh, New York and New Jersey, who are landlords of the World Trade Center building, face significant liability in, in the wake of that attack. They faced a liability of almost 65% of the, um, while the terrorists were only facing 35% of the liability, and which is a pretty jaw-dropping decision. You don't need to be in the legal world or in risk management to think that that doesn't seem to be fair. How could victims of the attack be also held more liable than the actual terrorists? And, and what we used to say when I was at the department is, you can't sue a terrorist. They're either dead, they have no money, or you can't access their money. But given the nature of a terrorist attack, you need to recover. People have lost uh, their lives, people have been injured, businesses have been disrupted, and that's the nature of acts of terrorism. They're designed to cause that type of havoc and, and terror, of course. Um, so people need to recover. You can't recover from terrorists, and unfortunately, uh, often businesses who might have otherwise been victims of the attack themselves are facing these extraordinarily large lawsuits. When you fast forward to 9-11, uh, and want to talk about this this case with the utmost sensitivity that it deserves, uh, one of the most tragic days in U.S. history. But from a legal standpoint, we saw a lot of the same things. Businesses who were otherwise victims of the attack were hit with extraordinarily large multi-billion dollar lawsuits. So following uh, those attacks, as Congress was looking to develop and set up the Department of Homeland Security, industry came to Congress and Congress responded and essentially the idea was that industry said, if we do not start receiving a little bit more support from the government following attacks like these, um, they're going to pull out of the fight against terrorism here in the homeland. Uh, it, it's, it's putting their enterprise up at risk uh, for trying to do the right thing. And so uh, you get second guessed easily. And so the Congress responded. And in the same piece of legislation that stood up um, the Department of Homeland Security, it's the Homeland Security Act of 2002. They, they included the Safety Act, which is, as you can read on the slide now, the acronym is Support Anti-Terrorism by Fostering Effective Technologies. The point of the Safety Act program is to do this. For those organizations that can demonstrate they're doing something to either prevent, detect, deter, or mitigate an act of terrorism, Congress, through the Department of Homeland Security, will provide critical, powerful, third-party liability protections so that should something still go wrong, despite all of the great work an organization is doing, that organization can be protected on the back end uh, if they have this award. So it's, it's really a way to incentivize the private sector to continue making strides in the fight against terrorism by either investing in technology or investing in um, security practices that will make their venues or their products more, more effective. Um, and so one of the points I like to uh, drive home about is I always like to use this slide. And I guess for those in the sports industry, it might be a, a good uh, metaphor, but allow me to walk down this road for a moment. The Safety Act, not only does it provide liability, critical liability protections, a cap, a numerical cap on your third party liability arising out of an act of terrorism. That's super powerful. But it does something else as well. It's an ability to win the failure versus defeat argument. Um, I think everyone would agree that there's dif different definitions for failure and defeat. And if you allow me to use the, the, the corny sports analogy here, a failure means you didn't do the things that you were supposed to do. A boxer didn't eat right. He didn't study his opponent. He didn't do the slow running montages on the beach like you see in Rocky. He wasn't even thinking about what he should be doing. While defeat means you did the things you could do, and yet you, you still lost. And... Um, and that means you trained and you did all those things. And I'm not stealing from another corny uh, sports analogy. It's like in the NFL, on any given Sunday, any team can win. There's that, there's that parity. So 
in this example here, I always point to the fact that when Ali and Frazier won, uh, fought for the first time in Madison Square Garden in 1971, Frazier beat Ali. Were people in the arena that night to believe that Muhammad Ali was a failure, that he was a bum at boxing? Or was it the fact that Frazier got the better hand of him that night? Uh, as we go on to show, the history shows that Muhammad Ali went on to have the, the greater career. He fought Frazier two more times and beat him both times. So, you know, it's just a way to drive home the point that left of the boom, or I should say right of the boom, it's very hard to make the point that you did the things you could do. Reasonably expected of a, of an, a, a company trying to, to do the right things. But with Safety Act in hand, you win that argument. You're really defending the decisions you're making today and make, defending the investments you're making today in security. So it's a, it's a pretty powerful tool, and a lot of organizations have taken advantage of it. I'll talk briefly about how the program has evolved over the years um, so that we can uh, get to where it is today. I guess prior to that, well, one item I wanted to ask a question on. The previous slide, we had two images there of designation and certification. Can you provide a little bit of commentary on the differences within Safety Act and, and the different options that sellers can have to, to obtain Safety Act? That's a great question, Matt. Thank you for that. Um, absolutely. The Safety Act, there are, there are different levels of coverage you can obtain. Um, I'll, I'll focus on the two main levels. There's a third level, but let's just talk about the two main levels. And, and if you want, Matt, we can uh, show the, the different seals. Uh, the seals are cor correspond with the different levels. So the blue logo is for the Safety Act designation. Think of that as an A in grade school. That is a very significant award. It's very tough to achieve. But if you achieve the designation, you get a numerical cap on your third party liability should an act of terrorism occur and you know, lawsuits are, are filed from that. Um, the certification is like the A plus in grade school. It's immunity from the same types of claims, third party claims arising out of an act of terrorism. So there's two levels of coverage. A lot of folks want to know, well, what's the, what do I need to do to get the certification over the designation? Uh, I would say that the level of effort for even the designation is pretty high because as you can imagine, what the government is doing is, is, is essentially protecting you in, in the face of lawsuits. You've really got to earn it. So uh, I would, I, I always tell folks, really focus on the designation, but there are two levels of coverage. Designation numerical cap certification is, the, is uh, immunity from third party claims arising out of an act of terrorism. Perfect, great. Thanks for that clarification, Akmal. That's a great question. Um, I'm glad you asked it. And you know, so very briefly, I want to run through this a little bit and get get us to the the real germane part of our conversation. But just so you know, um, folks, Safety Act has been pursued by in the past um, manufacturers of products and uh, many uh, service providers. Uh, but when I was still in the department, we came to the realization slowly, uh, quickly that okay, um, where are the avenues of potential liability? Well, the folks who manufacture products that go into venues clearly have, um, th their product has to work effectively. So the department was reviewing applications from widget manufacturers, sensor manufacturers, cameras, and soon we came to the realization that those products are only as good as the service providers who use them, deploy them, integrate them, repair them. And then it, it soon became obvious to us that venue operators have a lot of the liability, potential liability, I should say. They're making you're making decisions every day, where to deploy your your technology, where to deploy your guards, how to work with law enforcement, um, and how to design your buildings. Quite frankly, um, and so around 2008, 2009, we saw that the sports leagues really got behind in support of the Safety Act for obvious reasons. Um, and so, you know, the NFL. Major League Baseball, National Basketball Association, all at the league levels have engaged in safety act and obtained league level awards. And uh, all of the leagues are encouraging, if not requiring their teams, the clubs within their organizations to go and pursue safety act as well, because the liability protections are so powerful, uh, quite frankly. So, you know, as, as and so this is the, the segue into our conversation today. Uh, and as you can see here, a number of organizations that have gotten involved. By the way, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that, you know, it's not just sports, it's entertainment venues. It's also places of mass gathering like convention centers, which I know is a, a very important topic uh, to the community at IAVM. Uh, but it's also critical infrastructure. It can be bridges. Port Authority got the George Washington Bridge approved, um, World Trade Center campus, design of buildings, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, and also airports, aviation uh, 
industry uh, and the like. So I think you know, these different individuals that are getting Safety Act, that's typically called an, an award. They receive a Safety Act award and DHS I think, recently awarded their thousandth uh, Safety Act award. So as, as you can tell, a lot of these, these venue operators, both in sports, aviation, like you're mentioning, there's a lot of folks out there um, in today's world that are, that are getting Safety Act. A thousand, a thousand awards have been, have been issued. Absolutely. It's now become the de facto best practice in most of these industries. In other words, you know, again, this is not regulation. This is not required by law. This is an incentive program. If you want to get on board, you've got to demonstrate to DHS you're doing the things that make you worthy of the protections. But in a lot of these industries, like the sports world, it's become the de facto best practice. If you are not pursuing Safety Act, um, you're kind of, you're, you're the, uh, you know, you are the um, exception, not the rule. And that's been pretty powerful. And I have to say, I have to commend DHS because they've really extended their their uh, arms out to, to the sports leagues, and, and the sports leagues have responded. So that's right. And and the things you can get Safety Act coverage for at a venue is pretty is pretty exhaustive. Um, so and, and yeah. that, that kind of leads us into our, our next topic of how were venues originally getting Safety Act, and what are some approved Safety Act technologies? So I'll, I'll let you continue on with what what you were getting to there. So you, you'll be, uh, folks on the, on the line, if you're not aware, you'll be pleasantly pleased to, to hear that a lot of the things you are already doing at your venue uh, are eligible for Safety Act coverage. Now, to what extent are you doing it and how are you carrying out your programs is, is a different story. But if you're doing things like running uh, risk assessments and having security manuals and standard operating procedures where you memorialize what, you, what your procedures are, how you're corresponding with local law enforcement, um, screening activities like of spectators and patrons coming into your venue. These are all things that folks have already been receiving Safety Act coverage for. So if you go to safetyact.gov and click on the approved technologies link on the homepage, you can actually see a running tab of companies who've gotten Safety Act, including venues um, and your industry. And what you'll notice is that companies are seeking coverage for a lot of a lot of things, which is a great thing. That's the, that's the point. How can we protect ourselves from liability um, by seeking coverage from the safety deck. So think of everything from the way you set up your security procedures, the way you hire, you know, the way you train your guards, the way you have your command center set up, um, all the way down to the way your canine program looks, running tabletop exercises. It's an exhaustive list. That's a good, that's a good thing. That's a great thing. And now you've got to earn it from DHS. They don't give these things out, but uh, you can get a lot of things covered for, within a venue operating plan, and that's, uh, that's a really great thing. So this may be a loaded question, Akmal, but from the list and what you've just described, are any of those technologies mandated or definite that as a venue operator, I would need to, to do or employ within my facility to get Safety Act? Absolutely. So, I mean, uh, mandated, you know, again, this is not a regulated program, but if you're going to play in the Safety Act world, you've got to, you know, you've got to sing, you know, you've got to be doing the things that are expected of you. And, and uh, you know, a lot of these things are best practice already, but DHS has done a wonderful job in taking this thing, these things to the next level. So if you are interested in seeking Safety Act coverage and you do not have a good way to sweep deliveries coming into your building, to screen them for potential uh, um, you know, explosive devices, if you want to seek Safety Act coverage but you're not screening your, fan, your fans or your patrons or your spectators coming to your venue with either metal detectors or some other types of devices, you, know, you're, you need not apply. If you're looking to develop these programs and you want to use Safety Act as sort of a backbone, well, there's, there's a lot of literature on kind of what we're going to be discussing here in a moment about on the protective design. There's a lot of great um, guidance there, and so, but you're but you're absolutely right. These are things, and, and that you know, Catalyst. Well, what we, well, we've spent a lot of our time is assisting folks and identifying what are those main principal things. What does it mean to have a canine program? You know, that can mean a lot of things. And so there are some nuances to it, but ultimately this is what DHS wants to hear from you if you're seeking safety act coverage. Here's how I know, here's what we're doing to combat terrorism, and here's how we can demonstrate that we're effective. Perfect. Great answer, Akmal. I've got another loaded question for you that we'll, I think we'll see come up again as we talk about protective design, but what uh, the attendees may be wondering is time frame. So time frame for implementing these types of, of measures into a facility to obtain safety act. So Lee, I'll let you have that, that question. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that is a loaded question. Well, it, it's different for everybody. 
um, not, not to be elusive on that response, but if one of the things, as I mentioned a moment ago, you have to tell DHS what you're doing, but then you also have to demonstrate that it's effective. Um, and how you demonstrate something's effective is kind of tricky. You can't point to the fact that there not, has not been an act of terrorism at your venue to as a means to demonstrate you're effective at stopping terrorism. I wish it would be that easy, but it's not. Um, so step one is, do you have all these things in place? And then by, by no means is the list on the, on the slide now exhaustive, um, but it's, a, it's a, just a representative sample. So step one of the process is, are you doing the things you need to do? If you're not, then there's some time there to figure out what are those things you're not doing, um, cost it out, put it, you know, maybe select vendors, put it in place. It might be just an SOP thing, it might be just a policy or procedure. That takes time. And then, of course, once you have a program in place, you have to collect effectiveness data. That's a really big key term, and actually, it's something we'll talk about in a moment uh, regarding the work that Walter P. Moore does uh, so effectively. Effectiveness data. And in each one of these cases, it's something different. Effectiveness data for a good canine program is different than an effectiveness data for we have good screening operations. And of course, completely different than how you, you demonstrate or effectiveness data for a protective design uh, program. So um, that takes time to collect that data. But if you have all of that information and you're ready to submit, uh, you've got to prepare an application. It's a white paper review. Everything has to be documented and you submit through the Safety Act website. DHS is taking roughly 150 to 170 calendar days for large venue applications. They're very complicated. Typically, DHS averages less than 120 days on your more straightforward widget application, but there's a lot going on. The program um, has had a lot of success, but unfortunately, that means it's got a lot of workload now. And so they have been actively um, pursuing ways to um, you know, I don't think they can get more efficient. That is a program that you will find is to be one of the most efficient run federally government agencies uh, around. So um, they pride themselves on that. I, I applaud them for that. I think everyone does. But applications, you, once you press the submit button, there's a evaluation uh, process that takes about 150 to 170 calendar days. And, and throughout that process, you can expect rounds of requests for information where DHS wants to follow up on certain information that they're asking. Yeah, great answer. So moving into the next topic here, what has caused venue operators to consider additional protective design measures for protecting their facilities, including vehicle ramming and blast resistant design? And this is this is where I get really excited about the conversation because uh, to have Walter P. Moore here to speak on a very um, complex topic, but to speak about it in a way that I think will disarm folks because this is a it's sophisticated uh, this level of analysis, but what we want to do in this conversation is just trying to explain why it's been so important. So to answer the question, as DHS evolves in the Safety Act and considers different things, and as venues propose seeking coverage for different things, everyone gets smarter. The industry gets a bit smarter. Uh, DHS is getting a, a smarter on the topic. And naturally, as it continues to evaluate venue security, I think DHS and I think industry as a whole has come to the conclusion based on what we've seen in threats across the around the world in the last five five years, three years even, is that you can't purport to have a, an effective security program if you can't explain what you're going to do about certain threats like the vehicle ramming, vehicle as a weapon threat, or an improvised explosive device, whether that's a man portable uh, improvised explosive device or a vehicle born improvised explosive device. Those two things, as we've seen across the world, this is not an academic theory, right? This is things that unfortunately we've seen around the world, whether it's the attack on the Ariana Grande concert in Manchester, vehicle ramming attacks that we just see all too often now. You know, you, you can look at the things that are happening in places like Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan, but you don't have to. You can look here, what's happening in the homeland, what's happening uh, in North America, unfortunately. So. Now the time has come where DHS wants to know, what are you doing to protect your venues from these two major significant threats that have been growing? So yes, they care about delivery process and the command center and cameras, but they, they're increasingly concerned about what folks are doing. And what I, the point I wanna make here is, and I think, Matt, I'm so looking forward to hearing your, your thoughts on the topic is this. The whole point about effectiveness, how do you prove effectiveness and how do you obtain effectiveness data? When it comes to preventing a vehicle ramming or a vehicle as a weapon threat or an improvised explosive device, 
there's only so many ways you can demonstrate that you're effective. You're never going to try to run over your building with a state with a vehicle to prove that it's effective. You're not going to do that. You're also not going to set off a, a you know, a piloted, uh, you know, a, a test IED to see how your building responds. There's other more sophisticated and, and cost efficient ways to do that. And that's what DHS has been really responding to a lot lately is if you're going to demonstrate to DHS that you are uh, protecting your venue in these ways, You've got to do it in a way that makes sense, and there's some best practices and in industry standards that you know. I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on. Um, that's become, you know, like you said, almost a mandate now. If you're coming in for safety act for venue protection, you better be able to speak to that topic. Great, great start there, and great segue into the meat of our of our discussion here. So just to hammer that point home. So as a venue operator, what are you concerned about? Hosting a great concert? Your fans enjoying America's pastime? A conference and exhibit hall where individuals come to share knowledge and thoughts. A fantastic passenger experience through your airport. Now, I'm sure as security and protection of your patrons will always be a concern for you, but what you do not want to be concerned about is wondering if your facility could mitigate a terrorist attack. And just to, to again hammer that home, what we're talking about with vehicle vector or vehicle ramming and blasters and design, what do those types of events look like? So here we have a truck striking a bollard or a design bollard to prevent a vehicle ramming type of event. And just, just shows you the magnitude of a force and load of, of that type of attack on, on a design component. Um, and you never want to think about this actually being individuals, but we see that all too often is what I'll describe. Or a blast load. This is a, a video of, of a blast, blast load striking a window system and that window system impacting a, a dummy um, or you know, what could be a, a, a patron if, if the, the design isn't completed correctly. So these, these are extraordinary loads uh, that we're dealing with that the terrorist attacks, uh, terrorists use to, to attack individuals and facilities with vehicle ramming and, and uh, explosive events. As Dokmal mentioned uh, previously, you know, we've seen these events occur, not only internationally, but here in the U.S. So some notable events recently where uh, attackers have, have attacked venues and attacked individuals attending at different types of events. We've had the Las Vegas shooting in 2017. Dokmal mentioned the Ari Ariana Grande concert bombing in 2017. And then we also had the Paris bombings in 2015, with one of those locations being near a a soccer stadium where the individuals had to shelter in place uh, following a, an ex improvised explosive device at that at that facility. And that's just to name a few. There's been numerous others that have occurred. Unfortunately, before. yeah. So building into that, so how, how do you design a facility for vehicle ramming and blast resistant design? So to add some imagery and context of that, that discussion. And, and as Akmo kind of mentioned previously, that this isn't um, this isn't arbitrary. That we're putting actual science to show that there is effectiveness with employing these types of analyses into, into a project. Um, go ahead. And, and, and what I might add is that for the folks uh, following along here, this is really where, you know, I would really uh, implore you to to, to think about what Matt's about to discuss here, because when we talk about effectiveness data for protective design, these two analyses, these measures, these, 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 these assessments is really what, it, it's the most effective way that we, the, I think that DHS has seen that I've seen to demonstrate, because at the end of the day, DHS has to, has to feel comfortable that you're doing the right things. And until you look at your, uh, uh, assess your venue in th this manner, and I'm really excited to hear Matt go into this a little bit, um, and just hopefully you'll, you'll find, hopefully we can shed light on this and explain why this is such an important step in the process. Perfect. And, and in the secure design world and multiple more secure design world, doing these types of analyses for facilities isn't anything new. Akmal mentioned earlier in the, in the conversation about the 1993 and 2001 attacks at World Trade Center building. So we in the secure design industry have been employing these types of design methodologies um, into our projects for decades, um, mainly in the federal and military environment. But these types of analyses ha have occurred and resulted of the World Trade Center attacks. Uh, they resulted of the, the Kobar Tower bombings in Saudi Arabia that housed Department of Defense individuals. 
Uh, many of you may be familiar with the Oklahoma City bombing uh, that occurred, and uh, there's been U.S. Embassy bombings that have occurred in Tanzania and Kenya. So again, these, these types of analyses are, are nothing, nothing new. Now we're just translating those to other types of venues that, that need, need that level of protection. So to break it down, uh, the vehicle vector analysis is what we're looking for is, again, employing uh, methodologies within engineering and, and physics to examine how do vehicles of different sizes, based upon the site configurations where a venue is located, what is the maximum speeds and target locations of where they could impact potential individuals? And we use that engineering background to calculate and determine that information and then employ the right technologies to mitigate potential attacks that could occur. Oh, well, anything you want to add there to that, that discussion? Or? No, that's great. Okay. Yep. And then similarly, uh, with the BLAST analysis, uh, we're, we're taking engineering and physics principles and we're, we're working with, with Ockmall's team, with the, the client venue owner's team, and with the, the local individuals, um, public safety individuals, where the venue is located to determine credible, what we call a design basis threat, explosive events that could occur at a facility. And what we do is we calculate what those loadings are, last loadings are in a building. So similar to general structural engineering, like a wind load, like a seismic load, a blast load is very similar to that. And we subject that, that blast load onto the building to determine what needs to be done to mitigate those blast, blast loads from impacting and, and hurting individuals um, at, at the particular facility. So just a little to dive in of how we do that process. And I think it, in working with, with Akmal, uh, one of the things that he's, he stresses is the organic nature of the development of this, this process. So what, what we're doing again is, is employing our background of doing protective design, secure design on federal military facilities and employing that into the private sector world on these different types, types of venues um, and, and melding that with uh, Ockmal's experience and the local local experience of other other public safety individuals. So what we typically do, well, and, and just to add a, a point there because I think that's such a great point, man. I'm glad you raised it. We don't want to apply, and I don't think DHS is implying that we have to apply the same standards for a State Department embassy in you know in Iraq to the way you're going to build your convention center or, or your arena or your stadium or your airport, whatever, your shopping center, whatever you might be. But the processes, the analysis, the steps should be the same. And the, the, interest, the, the interesting thing, again, is DHS is not necessarily saying do it this way. They're just saying explain to me how you did it and defend the effectiveness. And this is one of those ways. I mean, you follow this roadmap you're going to be able to defend the effectiveness of your decision now. Um, but we'll, we'll get into them in a moment, just exactly what the steps are. But I just want to make sure that, that, you know, part of the process should be to work with local law enforcement and local resources to understand your venue and your neighborhood and your uh, concerns, rather than just taking some standard that's been built here, you know, in DC and carried to your locale and, and forced down on you. It's, it's more of a process than it is standard uh, requirements. Great point, Akmal, and, and that's exactly where, as you, as you can see on the screen, this phase development of how we incorporate protective design into a facility, is we employ that same, that same process and tailor it to the specific event that we're looking at. So to break it down, we start with a phase one threat and vulnerability assess assessment. And so what does that entail? Again, with following that, that idea of a process that we would employ on a federal facility, facility or a facility seeking safety act. We we engage with the owner and with the local group um, uh, that, that that manages and oversees the, the facility that we're looking at. We actually go and do a, a site visit. Um, sometimes that's tailored with Ockmall, and we're seeing the different types of operational procedures, how the facility operates, where there could be potential vulnerabilities, and documenting all that that information. But when we're also doing that that uh, that site investigation process to support the threat and vulnerability assessment is we're also taking note of where could there be a vehicle attack so that when we go back and we do our engineering calculations for vehicle vector analysis, we're getting that actual data specific to that site. And similarly, where could a blast event occur? Where could you stop a, an IED of a certain size here versus an IED of another size here? And then we go back and we digest and analyze 
those those different uh, en engineering calculations to to build up that that process that Akmal talked about. And and again, to to stress the importance of the organic nature and development of this process. What's very important in those initial meetings and developing the threat and vulnerability assessment is meeting with those local individuals to understand how the, the public safety and police forces and bomb squads, how do they operate? What are their procedures uh, at the facility during an event um, that, that's happening there? And what would happen if an event were to occur? What, what processes do they have in place? Because all those, those stories in some sense build into the, the safety act um, procedure that, the, that this entity is looking to employ. And, and another thing that element to this that I think will be very intriguing for the folks on the phone or on the webinar is the fact that this assessment process also needs to and will consider and should consider what protective design things you've already implemented. A lot of places where I go and there may not be a complete hardened perimeter 360 degrees, but there's a lot of stuff already in the ground. Well, that's great. We don't want to suggest that that needs to be redone. We just we just need to be able to clearly articulate the current crash rating of those things and the the impact it would have on the threats and the design basis threats that uh, Matt just uh, elegantly discussed. Um, so, but without that, if you approach DHS and you say, "Well, I've got ballers in the ground, or I've got this big rock and boulder over here." Um, short of being able to tell DHS what the crash rating level is and how you determine its crash rating level, it, you know, naturally DHS is just going to not, uh, it's not going to go very far because again, at the end of the day, DHS is making a recommendation to cap liability, uh, you know, potential liability. It's going to feel comfortable that uh, there's a, there's a public trust element to the safety act. And before DHS puts a cap on anyone's liability, it's got to have, the ability to say, yes, we know that they're doing these things. And so that, that part of the assessment is so important to give you credit for what you may have already done and invested in, and, th and, th and that will come out in that part of the report. Is that right, Matt? And, and that's, a, that's a great point, Akmal. I mean, and we're seeing that in a lot of the projects that we work on is venue operators are, are doing a lot of great things already, and we're, we're supplementing that with our engineering analysis approach to show the effectiveness of what they've done previously because we want to support and build their case um, on that. So it might not be uncommon for you to get to a venue and have a venue operator have good things in the ground, but they can't defend how good those things are. Your analysis might actually help make underscore the great work they've already done and the money they've already invested. And that's exactly right. And, and as we're engaging with those individuals, when we have those meetings, that's, that's one of the questions that we'll ask. You have these fantastic looking bollards that are outside. Do you know what they were designed for? Is there, has there been a design for it? And sometimes yeah, the answer is yes, but more than not, it, it, it's not, it's, we don't have an answer for that. So again, that, that's where we, we take our, our engineering background to go back and show that level of effectiveness. What is that, what is that baller good for? What is that security screening measures that you've employed to make sure that you are checking so that certain size IEDs can be prevented from coming into, into the building? So that's where it's kind of the meaning of optimal understanding the operational and protective design features that, that need to be employed. And then we supplement that that background with putting the actual hard engineering calculation numbers to show that level of effectiveness. I, I can't underscore the importance of that work that um, that you guys do on that point because it, it just helps drive home, it helps defend those measures that you couldn't otherwise defend without that analysis. And let's talk a little bit about what does that term effectiveness mean, in particular when we're talking about protective design. And, and what we see it to mean is why, why you do blast resistant design components of a facility, which may be harding glazing or harding, harding concrete elements, and why you introduce bollards onto a facility is you're protecting people. So how we show that these, these components are, are effective is how do you have less injuries if an event were, were to occur? Um, so that, that's a really important process and, and, and component within within the phase one portion of, of the assessment and then moving into, into the phase two where what we do in phase two is we, we meet with the owner, we meet with Akmal, and we go through various mitigation measures related to protective design where we may recommend bollards, where we may recommend um, pushing screening out so that you have, have a, a smaller size IED at, at a certain location or implementing a protective type of building components like glazing uh, hardened glazing into certain locations, and we present those to to the owner 
and it's a it's a collaborative process to determine what what measures do we want to implement into this facility to better protect it. And and again, I think Ockmul's stressed some good approaches with that is it's the organic development of that. So yes, ultimately we're working towards a safety X emission, but we want to show that that the owner is making these selections of doing items X, Y, and Z to show that they have a better protected facility to mitigate a potential terrorist attack. Yeah, I think it might be worth um, saying something that might be a very obvious comment. F folks who go down this road aren't doing it just to achieve safety act. And Matt, you, you basically have already said this, so I'll just, I'll just underscore the point. You're doing it because it's the right thing to do. You're doing it because it protects the occupants in your building, employees, fans, the general public. You're doing it because you're a good steward of a public venue. Um, it just so happens that these are things that also help you get this great significant award as well. So we definitely want to acknowledge the fact that people, you know, these are this is significant work and this is important work, but it's because it's 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 the it's the effective way and right way of protecting people. Yeah, it's a great point. So again, in that phase two, we're actually implementing these design features, and and in the architectural engineering construction world that the Walter P. Mint War lives in a lot, we're developing actual construction documents to take these projects uh, potentially into a construction type of phase of where we're adding bollards to the facility where we could be replacing glazing and that ultimately translates into the phase three portion of the project where it's the construction administration phase of that and, and I mentioned Akmal earlier that this this component of, of time is going to come up again so I think this is a good time good time to, to talk about that here when we start implementing these protective design measures into facility in particular, if a facility needs to go into a construction type phase to add bollards or add glazing and hardening glazing into their facility, is that something that the venue operators need to be cognizant of as they're going and pursuing safety act? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's always nice to engage DHS early in the process, but sometimes, you know, it's, it's also helpful to have something to show first. And so I don't recommend at all waiting until all the construction is done before you engage DHS, but I think it's important to at least have the uh, threat vulnerability risk assessment phase one and phase two completed so that you can at least demonstrate to DHS that you're taking the topic very seriously and that you actually have something to show them for them to consider. DHS offers a pre-application process where you're able to basically draft, put together a draft of your application. And I, I highly recommend that your pre-application should include at least those things so you can at least tell DHS here's what we have observed here's what we're how we're going to go about mitigating it and and maybe in a moment we'll uh, ask Matt to help uh, speak to the uh, the cost benefit analysis which is a very very important piece of the puzzle here because you can come up with a thousand mitigating strategies and it could cost you a billion dollars and you don't have a billion dollars to put towards this um, not all of us do. <laughs> at least not all of us so the question really becomes the art of how you defend what things you do put your limited money into, which is a significant part of it. But you know, you also want DHS to evaluate you for that process, which it will. And I don't know if it might be a good time now to maybe even discuss that a little bit. Is and you touched on it a little bit earlier, which is you, you take the design basis threats. That's the threat. You apply it to the building as it exists today, and then you look at the impact. And if the impact is de deemed unacceptable. You, you come up with ideas of how to mitigate that, and each mitigation strategy might have a different consequence on the reduction of injury. Or, but can you walk a little bit through that, Matt, and describe that? Because I think that's a, you find that to be one of the most critical pieces as well when you're deciding, working with an owner on what to do in the design phase. Correct, and, and that's also, to some extent, the most challenging portion of it, and that's where all of our engineering analyses build up to. Because it's, as Ockmo described, it's one thing to do the engineering calculations to show that, but we have to build up to an ultimate, uh, I guess I'll, I'll say it's a decision point of what can we do to make this this facility more more effective. And Akmal is right, we can't, we can't do everything. We can't design for um, all different types of design basis threats uh, or else we'd be having a hardened bunker for some of these, these facilities. So it, it, it's a collaborative process where we come in and we supplement. Here is the engineering calculations that build up to the different potential options that the owner could select. It's an engagement with the owner of what do they feel is the best the best approach, and then it's engagement with with Akmal and his team of how do those those pieces of, of the protective design element 
fit into the ultimate process of, of the different components within Safety Act. Okay, that's great. Good, so we'll, we'll move on to the next topic here. Um, and we, we, before we do that, I guess we touched on these various components uh, of protective design services um, within this, this this component of the of the project in the phase phase one, two, and, and three. Um, so we won't go through each each of these items, but uh, since we touched on them, but just to give a context of of what what we may recommend in, in those mitigation features is the, an image here of a of a window system that's that's been hardened for blast. So you can see that the glazing is is pretty thick there um, to to mitigate a potential threat. The next topic is: um, Are there hurdles for doing vehicle ramming? And blast resistant design for for a venue, right? So uh, maybe Matt, I'll pose the question to, to you. I mean, you you guys have done this. You guys are one of the premier firms in the world doing this work. I mean, what what are things venue operators should consider? I mean, I think things that may not become completely obvious for folks who are not close to this. Um, you know, like things like considering traffic patterns out four blocks away and event related security posture or in traffic posture versus not a you know what are those things that folks maybe not be th are not thinking about that might arise for them going through these, these analyses sure and, and what's important is that even though these may be hurdles they're not showstoppers and the the key point is the good collaboration and communication with all parties involved um, in, in this process and what the end goal again is is to provide a better protected facility so we, we already talked about one one item which was the, the time component of, of of a project especially if, if the project does need to go into construction that needs to be considered um, and it may need to be phased over a court a, a longer time period but what's important is that as this group works through the safety act application is to show that intent of what we want to do so it may be difficult to install 900 bollards on a, on a project within within an off-season type of time period um, so we work together, Akmal, ourselves, and the, and the owners on these projects to, to plan that, uh, that process out right, that tells the story right um, to DHS when we go into a, to a submission. A another example of a hurdle that we may occur um, or encounter is existing conditions on a facility. So a, a lot of these facilities that are now um, seeking safety act, they are, they are existing facilities. So if they say do not have any bollards located on the site, one of the, the processes within the phase one and phase two efforts that our that our team does is to do do the assessments of the site and and that, as that evolves, it, it may be maybe getting existing drawings of the various utilities that are on the site because as we're adding the bollard type features to to a facility along a sidewalk, there may be pipes and conduit runs there that we need to consider. And that all factors into the engineering analysis that that we need to that we need to show. What happens if existing critical infrastructure like water or power in the city gets in your way from developing or implementing, you know, a baller system, a traditional baller system? I mean, that seems like a hurdle. Our folks, what is your recommendation there? Are there ways around that when you come across it? Great, great question. So, in particular, with bollards, there's I would say there's two approaches to how you can implement a baller. There's proprietary tested systems that are out there that you can take off the shelf. They have standard details that you can apply to the project. And then we can act, you can actually engineer the baller. So if there's a critical utility that impacts where a baller can go, that's where we, we have to put our engineering hats on. And can we, can we come up with a creative solution to bridge over those critical utilities per se, or, or use another approach to, to accommodate it? So, yeah. Sure. So that's existing conditions. Um, Akma kind of touched on one already, which is site features that are outside the control of the client. Um, in particular, with a lot of these, these venues, they're in an urban environment, and they may have their property lines within their vicinity, but what occurs outside of that vicinity is outside their control. So as we do the site assessment, you know, we may make, make a recommendation as an example of this street is it, it's a main thoroughfare through through the city. Um, ideally, we would like to see that blocked or traffic rerouted during an event so that we don't have an, an, a semi truck coming down the road. But but that may that may be impossible. But what, what's important there is again 
not to harp on too much on the, the collaboration aspect of it, is we're working with the owner to understand that. And then Akmal and our team um, builds up the discussion with the owner. Maybe we engage the local Department of Transportation to have a, at least that discussion of, hey, we're, we're seeking this type of protective measures for our facility. We know that this may be a challenge, but let's at least entertain the conversations with this with this type of thing to show that process that we're that the team is reaching out beyond their facility to make sure that the, the site as a whole is better protected. Right. And anything you want to add to that? Awkward? No, I think that um, that's a great segue into kind of you know a, a kind of parting point that I would make uh, to the folks listening is that you can do only what you can do, and and which. For DHS, they understand that. You've got to demonstrate that you're you're doing a step further than what you're probably used to doing. So if you come into a hurdle, as, as Matt nicely put it, it's not a showstopper. Hurdles are just something you have to get over. And um, figuring out different ways to solve a solution, and may, it may not have been, um, may, it may be closing a street rather than necessarily putting in uh, cross rated systems along one part of the venue. It may be changing traffic patterns, pedestrian traffic patterns, which revolves, involves you having to work with the city. So you can be creative. It's got to be effective, but you can be creative. And the one thing I'd give, another thing I'd give DHS credit for is being open to listening to those, to those different solutions. Great, Akmal. Well, and we have one last uh, panel topic here to, to wrap up the, the webinar is where do we see Safety Act going to or developing as we continue on here? Just like the vehicle ramming or vehicle as a weapon and IED uh, threats grew, Safety Act thought about them more or, or is asking about them more. Same thing with other new threats. Of course, uh, the topic du jour these days is drones. Um, and also, based on what we learned in Vegas, the sniper threat, elevated threat, um, is becoming another big to topic. And quite frankly, these are two more topics or two more threats that can be addressed by protective design. Um, so there's an, an interesting uh, correlation there as well. So there's, you know, this program's constantly evolving. I think as a member, as a citizen of the United States who knows, you know, you, you should feel good that the program's evolving this way. You know, it's keeping folks in the industry honest, and it's you know, sometimes it's like, oh, man, there's nothing else to, to fire to put out. But I think we wouldn't be doing ourselves justice if we weren't constantly evolving like this. So those are a couple of things that are on the that are here now that are kind of evolving threats, but I think protective design has a part to play in those as well, but it's constantly moving. And, and similar to that, Akmal, and um, yeah, I mentioned that a lot of this is being incorporated into existing facilities. I think we're going to see uh, a lot of the Safety Act process, in particular protective design, being incorporated into new facilities um, as, as they're being built, which from our, our experience and, and suggestion, that, that's the optimal time to be incorporating the Safety Act process, and in particular, the protective design measures into a facility is in the design and planning phases of that, of that project. Bake it in while it's cooking, right? That's right. That's yeah. right. And, and then I think we're going to see, in my opinion, an expanding market of protective design features that they themselves are going to, are going to be Safety Act designated or certified. And, and we're already seeing that in the industry, that there's, there's bollards that are out there. There could be other building components, um, like window glazing systems that are getting Safety Act certified itself to, to help uh, better better fit into the process of, of, of Safety Act for the facility and, as a whole. And what does that mean for you as the venue operator? If you have a product that you're looking at that has Safety Act coverage, you know a few things. Number one, that it's effective. It does what it says it can do. It's just been kicked, poked, and prodded by DHS, and DHS has come out on the other end saying this thing does what it's supposed to do. So it's a little, little significant comfort as a procurer of, of that thing that you know it's actually going to work. And of course, the way Safety Act legislation is written, by way of a, a product manufacturer's coverage, you as a, cus flow, a customer receive flow down immunity by way of their award, specific to the liability issue related to that product. But that's a very powerful thing to be able to say. You're comparing two um, wedge barrier systems and one has Safety Act and one doesn't. You not only know that the one that does works, doesn't mean the other one doesn't, but at least you have confirmation that the one does. You also receive flow down liability protections as a result. Great point, Akmal. So with that, I'd like to thank you again, Akmal, for joining us here to have this discussion about the, the evolution of Safety Act. And, and thank IAVM uh, again for, for allowing us to host this webinar. Uh, thank, thank you to the audience for, for listening to us here. And at this point, we'll 
we'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, that was excellent. Uh, so if I do have a couple questions, Matt, can I just list them out to you? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think uh, at this time as well, Akmal has, has joined us and Akmal was traveling today and in fact for a safety act project. So you, you got both of us now here to answer some questions. Hey, Matt, can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Yep, we can hear you, Akmal. Great. Great. Okay, here we go. Uh, what level of protection can be associated with the developmental testing and evaluation designation certification? So the, the developmental testing and evaluation designation otherwise known as the DTED, it's a, it's, an, it's, an, it's a subset of the designation. So we went over the two awards, certification and designation. The DTED is really a sub, uh, subset of the designation, and it's really intended for those programs that um, are, get, are up and running, right? They don't, they, they've got the program kind of baked out, but there's not a lot of effectiveness data built up over years. And so this is really an opportunity to have some coverage, limited coverage in place, while you're out developing and getting more effectiveness data. So it still provides a numerical cap on third party liability. I will tell you that DHS is a little more reserved on how they um, provide those protections for a venue, but it is possible. Okay. So Akmal, uh, in that, in that yeah. kind of general scoring scheme that you gave previously, that would you say that's, that's more like a, an A minus or a B plus in that rating scale? Yeah, I would say it's a, it's a look at it as a B plus in grade school, and not that the, not that it doesn't mean that the program isn't good. It just means that there's not the amount of effectiveness data that DHS is looking for to def, to defend the decision to give you all of these great uh, protections, of course. It, but the good news is it still provides basically the same level of um, coverage as a regular designation, but it, there's some nuances. Uh, the awards aren't la don't last as long as the as a designation. They're only good for three years. Um, it comes with some strings attached. DHS has some reporting requirements that you might have in a DTED, which might require you to report back to DHS ever so often through the course of the award. A designation typically does not. So there, there's some other nuances to it as well. Okay, uh, let's see here. What conversations has there been on what the definition of terrorism is, i.e. the Safety Act would not protect us from domestic acts of terrorism by a lone wolf American citizen? Matt, if you'd like, I can go on, jump on this first. Yeah, go ahead. Um, take, that, take that first. Yeah, the, the uh, just to be clear, Safety Act does a, a domestic acts of terrorism. Lone Wolf would be eligible under Safety Act coverage. There's no, um, there's no differentiation between an international actor and a domestic actor. Uh, what really, uh, the the real point is, was it you know. What was the purpose? What was the intent? Now, there's been a lot of discussion lately because technically the legislation, the Safety Act legislation, the final rule does not require an intent. But I think if you read the Safety Act with legislative, through the lens of a legislative intent, um, you know, sort of the, the, the way you read these things is you, you put yourself in the position of the, of the folks who wrote this law at the time that they wrote it. And I think it's clear that there's an expectation that there be some link to it to terrorism, to wanting to invoke fear, to wanting to get a point across, to to um, threaten the you know government or something like that. You know, so would safety act cover a domestic terrorist? Yes. Would it cover a hostile work environment, a domestic violence incident? Um, you know, someone who is mentally ill and has no no prescribed motive? No, I don't think it, it would extend to those to to uh, to those scenarios. Okay. Uh, let's see. And I'll also so, sorry to add in, into that as well. I think, you know, if you go on to the DHS, uh, I believe it, it identifies what an act of terrorism um, is as it pertains to the Safety Act. Is that correct? That's right. They don't they don't give us specific examples, but I think those are the general parameters, right? Yep. Um, I don't think we have any other questions. Uh, we can also open it up. We have like a, like one more minute left. If someone wants, I guess, one more question via audio, uh, you can raise your hand digitally, and I will be happy to unmute you. Give it a couple seconds for that. Okay. Um, any final thoughts, gentlemen? Uh, I guess I'll start with you. No, I think this is an exciting time in, in this area. DHS has really shown over and over again that they're committed 
to providing those protections to companies who can show that they're really fighting for it. So I think it's an exciting time if you're a venue operator, just a matter of, uh, you know, uh, reaching out to DHS and, and sharing with them all the good things that you're doing. Excellent. Matt? Sure. I, I think it's, it's very important uh, that we're protecting the people and places uh, within this country. And that's what, what drives me um, in the secure design field to provide that level of protection for for facilities. So uh, we really appreciate th this opportunity to share uh, our, our experience between Catalyst Partners and Walter P. Moore of working on these projects. Um, and so thank you, Greg, and the rest of IVM for, for having us for this, this webinar. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, now, of course, Walt even more is an ally member of ours, so you can reach them, uh, obviously, VenueNet. Uh, I'll be sending out their recording via email, and I'll, I'll include Matt and Akmal's email if you want to get in touch with them. Uh, but that being said, we hope you have a wonderful week, and we look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.